Have you ever wondered what forensic genealogy is? Well, we're going to talk about that today, what it is and what it is not. Welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. If this is your first time here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, and factually with your family research. Now, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. Uh, sign up for the newsletter and find us on Facebook. Now, in this episode, we have a lot of links that we talk about, and we're going to provide all those links in the show notes below for your convenience. Now, this is a footnotes episode. The footnotes episodes are wildly popular. Well, I call them footnotes because it's in the footnotes where the real sources are, and today's real source is a professional genealogist out of Colorado. Her name is Christine Cochran. She's going to tell us all about forensic genealogy in just a moment. Well, welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. Gosh, I'm so thrilled that you're back again. Uh, this is your third appearance here. And for the people at home who may not be aware, Christine here has done the Anton Wood story and the Civil War uh, Southern Claims Commission record. Both videos, wildly popular. Um, I will leave links in the top there for you if you want to see those. So welcome back. I'm Thank glad you. you're here. <laughs> Great to be here. Before we get started with forensic genealogy, if people want to find you, where do they find you at? I have an online web, pre web presence. Um, my company's name is Our Provenance because your provenance is our provenance. And it's at www.ourprovenance, ourprovenance.com. Wonderful. So today's subject, as I mentioned in the open, is forensic genealogists. And you're going to tell us all about it. Yeah, it's a really fascinating area. Um, I, I've uh, given this presentation a couple of times and people just really are, are drawn to this. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that when, I, when somebody says forensic genealogy, the first thing that pops into their head is DNA. Oh, that must be DNA analysis. Um, and, and actually, uh, for, the, the actual definition of forensic genealogy is basically just the application of genealogical methods to legal issues. So they're using, we're using all the same tools that uh, a genealogist would use. We're just sort of using them in a little bit different perspective and with a little bit different goal. And I'm going to go over how those, um, how we would use those tools and what mainly more what areas you would use them in. Wonderful. Let's jump in. Okay. So a pe lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of people wonder what is forensic genealogy. And the, the first thing that comes to mind is DNA. But in truth, the um, definition of forensic genealogy is just the application of genealogical methods to legal issues. Um, there's a lot of different areas that you can apply forensic genealogy to. Uh, but basically what it means is you're going in and uh, assisting people with some sort of a, a legal situation. Be that I put a, a list of them here. Land transactions is a good example. Na natural resources and mineral rights. Probate records dual citizenship, people who want to have um, citizenship both here in the United States and in another country, repatriation of military remains. I'm proud to say that we are a country that uh, leaves no man behind and we have, uh, there's a, a team of people out there constantly working on trying to repatriate the remains of our, our soldiers from other countries back to their home country. Unclaimed bodies is another area. Uh, criminal investigation, that's become very popular in the recent media, and I think the, I think the, uh, that area of specialization is really, the, that policing and FBI and investigation is really starting to see the value of genealogy in, this, in, in their area. Adoptions, people who don't know who one or both of their parents are and would like to. Um, guardianships, uh, expert witness, so you can see then an expert witness, of course, is somebody who's going to testify in a trial. So as you can see, there's a lot of different ways that you can apply forensic genealogy. I think the, the two underpinning points is, one, it's a legal issue, and two, it's a genealogy research. Nice. So um, really, genealogy, uh, forensic genealogy is using the same set of tools that we use for family history research in genealogy. Um, you're still actually researching people's family history. You're just doing it for a different means and a different ends rather than 
leaving behind, say, a story for generations of your family to come, you're trying to assist people in different areas in different, different legal capacities. So you're still using the same tools, DNA analysis, family street tree construction, census records, probate records, vital records, you're using um, cluster analysis. Uh, in other words, you're looking at the whole community and not just the individual. Uh, you're using very pre precise documentation and citation. And all of the tools that you use for forensic genealogy or for uh, family history genealogy, you also use for forensic genealogy. So um, there's a there are a lot of different people who need forensic genealogists. Um, you know, as I stated before, we're we're looking at genealogy as it pertains to legal issues. So you know, you might ask yourself, okay, so who is it that who who actually needs the assistance of a forensic genealogy a ge genealogist? Well, military services. We talked a little bit earlier about repatriation of military remains. Uh, local, state, and federal courts will use a genealogist. Uh, for advice and, and guidance and answers to certain questions. The criminal justice system, they're trying to um, apprehend people who have committed a crime and they need assistance. Uh, immigration and naturalization ser services, that's a big buzzword right, right now, particularly in our uh, current political situation. The first one is military services. Um, as I said before, repatriation of remains military remains, the no one left behind. I, I happen to be very proud that our country does this kind of thing. We don't send people off into the war and let them um, be killed overseas and make the ultimate sacrifice and just leave them and forget them. Um, they spend, they actually spend years and years and a lot of money repatriating those remains back to the, um, their families in the United States and identifying those, those remains. Um, another thing that's been real popular recently is dual citizenship applications. Now, this is actually, this is actually quite interesting. Um, the United States, if a lot of people would say, well, well, why do you need dual citizenship? Uh, first of all, there's always the romance of it. I don't know if you can see, you see this picture here where I have this, this lovely double rainbow that's ending in a castle. And it's absolutely gorgeous image. Being a photographer, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's quite a, a shot they captured there. And this is actually the remains of an old castle in Wales. Um, but there's a lot of romance in that. You know, everybody would, would like to be associated with, you know, their, their ancestors' homeland. They oftentimes have a spiritual bond with that, that country. Um, so there's the romance of it, but I think that there's something also at a spiritual level that uh, pulls people towards bonding with that country that their ancestors came from. Um, a lot of people are doing a lot of traveling, you know, and, and do, the, there's an ease of access and border crossing if you have dual citizenship in whatever country you're coming to and from. Um, some people feel that there's political instability or dis dissatisfaction with a current political climate, and there's, there's oftentimes an uptick right after a presidential election for people who are looking to be expatriates for a little while. It doesn't mean they're giving up, I say expatriates, it doesn't mean they're giving up their citizenship to the United States. It means that they're looking for somewhere else to live for a little while. Just sort of till things blow over, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, ownership of property is another good reason for dual citizenship. For example, in Prince Edward Island, um, non-residents have to have permission to buy more than five acres of property. So if you're looking at buying some property in Prince Edward Island and you want to buy more than five acres, then dual citizenship is uh, going to be to your advantage. Um, in the Saskatchewan area, the acquisition of property of over 10 acres is not permitted if you're not a citizen. So, um, you know, these are all, these are all really good reasons to want to apply for dual citizenship. And, in addition, there are certain benefits that you get when you're uh, a citizen of one country. Um, it might be welfare or dole benefits, retirement, social security benefits. Healthcare has been a big, a big one for a lot of people. Um, there are a lot of people in the United States who I think are overwhelmed with the American healthcare system uh, or a particular situation that they're in and they feel, you know, I can get better health care or I can get what I specifically need easier, cheaper, faster, or whatever uh, in another country. Well, if they're a citizen, a dual citizenship citizen of that country, boom, there's their passport that shows that and they're on their way 
um, to, to getting what they need there. So one of the things I did want to point out is that not all countries allow, allow dual citizenship. I and mean, for instance, the United States allows dual citizenship. Um, Ireland allows dual citizenship. Canada, England, Switzerland, there's a whole bunch of them that do. I'll just put a few uh, up there for examples. But there are some countries that do not allow dual citizenship. Mexico is one of them, Japan, China. There's probably quite a few more. But um, that might be something people want to keep in mind, too. But if you, if you do go down this road where you want to apply for dual citizenship, um, there's that, that's actually technically forensic genealogy. And there are certain things as a forensic genealogist uh, assisting someone who's applying for dual citizenship that you need to be aware of, uh, the kind of documentation you need to be collecting, what the policies are in the country that they're applying to, um, what the policies are with respect to the United States. There's, uh, it's a, it can be a whole specialization in itself, actually. I did not know that Japan uh, did not allow dual citizenship. That kind of surprised me. Yeah, I was actually a little surprised that Mexico didn't allow it. Um, I think that's rather interesting uh, in our in our really? current, in our current political situation. I was I was really rather surprised to learn that. And it's not just that they don't have it. They just, they flat out have laws and say, we don't allow it. <laughs> so uh, one example I wanted to give, um, there are a lot of people in the United States, a huge portion uh, of people in the United States who can trace their ancestry back to Ireland. And if one of your grandparents, there's, Ireland does offer dual citizenship to the United States. If one of your grandparents uh, was an Irish citizen, was born in Ireland, but neither of your parents were born in Ireland, you may actually uh, become an Irish citizen. There's a lot of little loopholes depending upon the, the country that you're in. But, um, you know, I, I, think, I, think, I think, again, that kind of ties in with the romance and that sense of tie to a country. Um, normally the people that come to me and say, I'd like to apply for dual citizenship, do I, uh, do I qualify? I think that's really what it's been about. It's been about that emotional tie to the old country. That's fascinating. You know, that's a hot subject too, Ireland. Uh, that's another one I need to create a video for is Irish research because I know that there's a, that's a, it's a hot topic. <laughs> well, I mean, when you consider, you know, the, the huge number of people in the United States who are actually of, of Irish descent, um, I actually just submitted an article to uh, Irish Roots Magazine, which is a, you know, internationally uh, circulated quarterly magazine on Colorado and Colorado pioneers of Irish descent. And that'll probably be coming out in August or the fall of, of this coming year. But uh, you, you, when you start rolling up your sleeves and start, start looking at these different communities, all this, you know, it's, almost like, it's almost like we have little mini countries within our communities here. You know, here's the Irish community and here's the Polish community and here's the um, the Jewish community, and they all, that's really what the United States about, is about. These places, these people come together and they have their own little areas and they're, they hold on to their own heritage, but then they mix in, in, in this wonderful American uh, society also. So, Well, and when you're doing uh, research in these various countries, a lot of times the record sets and the resources are so different from country to country that you really do kind of have to study each. We just did a video uh, a couple weeks ago on uh, Polish uh, genealogy. And um, I was really surprised at the popularity of that one. Not having Polish ancestry, I was kind of like lost listening to them talk about, you know, all the different resources that were available. I was, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I got Danish ancestry. I can understand that a little bit better, but. Anyway, I would well, and it's also amazing. I think a lot of times people don't realize how much how much documentation there is within the United States that will tell you about your ancestors and where they come from. I think it's really important. Uh, just as a side note here, I'm going down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but it's really oh, important to exhaust the resources that you have on your family here in the United States before you try to jump over the water and and locate them there, because you can find out things like. What, what church they went to, what town they were born in, and that way you can, you can focus your research right in to the area that you need to, and that's going to make a huge difference when, when you're tracing your family back over, 
over the oceans in the old country. Exactly. And with, especially with Irish research, I know that, you know, the number one rule is figure out where in Ireland they came from before you even try to go do research over there. So yeah. you're exactly right. <laughs> anyway, I will let you continue now. This is, this is an example that uh, I had actually helped a, helped a neighbor with. Um, land transactions. This is an example of, a, of where forensic genealogy comes into play for a land transaction. Uh, this, this neighbor of mine has a ghost road on his property. He's a next door neighbor and he wants to subdivide his property up to, to sell it. You know, so he, he's got a, a chunk of, of property that came down to him through the family. It's been in the family for, you know, a couple of uh, hundred years or more. And he's decided he wants to sell off a piece of his property. And when he went to subdivide the land, he found out that he couldn't do it yet because he had something called a ghost road going through his property. Uh, the ghost road was not, well, you'd have to really look for it. You can see it if you really, really look for it. But nobody knew it was there. Nobody's used it forever. And, um, but it turns out that he's got to get, the, the, ghost, the ghost road actually belongs to everybody in this area who owns property. It doesn't belong to him. It is a group ownership. And so in order for him to be able to divide up this, this land and sell it off, he has to get a quick claim from the neighbors in the, in the area who have an ownership in this property. So if you notice, I've got this map up and it shows, it shows all of these different um, properties. Well, there's this one tiny bit of pro property that comes on to his, his um, there's just one tiny piece of property in the neighborhood, I guess I should say. And I don't think you can even build on this piece of property. It's a very odd shape, it's really small. But that person, whoever it is, has ownership in this ghost road that I have highlighted here in yellow. And he's got to figure out who that is and get hold of that person. And he has not been able to do it through just well, the county tax uh, assessor or whatever. So he's trying to figure out, well, who owns this property now? Who owned it in the past? And um, how do we get hold of this person? Because he cannot sell this property until he's got a quick claim or a quiet quick claim from this person. So this is an example of how gene genealogy comes into play in a land transaction, say. That's, that's uh, fascinating. And, you know, I, over time, things get grown over, and <laughs> who knows as far as that road goes. Yeah, we, we actually walked, I walked over there to take a look at it, and um, I can see it once we have it pointed out, but nobody would have noticed it was there before. Um, so, yeah, that, that was kind of interesting, I thought. Wow. Here's a big one in Colorado, natural resources and mineral rights. This is another place where forensic genealogy is um, very much utilized. Um, for instance, a lot of people don't realize that the law defines minerals as real property when they're still in the ground and personal property after they're removed from the ground. So that's kind of interesting because, you know, all, when, it, when it's removed from the, from the ground, you're, you're basically going to sell it off and whatnot. But you also have um, rights to those minerals, uh, mineral interests and mineral rights. And those are oftentimes not, you know, here so-and-so has the, the mineral rights to the property uh, here. It's usually sort of a percentage. And so it breaks down and, um, you know, there's all kinds of applications for this, hydrocarbons, oil and gas, hard rock, metals like gold, silver, and copper, um, and other, other types of minerals, talc, bentonite, uranium. Um, but, the, but mineral interests actually pass with the land on which they are held, and they may pass through a lot of generations without people even knowing that they own a mineral right. You know, they may understand that they own the, the property, they may understand that they own the house on the property, um, but somewhere down there in the tiny print, they own the mineral rights, and they're not even aware of that. So this is an, kind of an example of what I was showing. Um, natural resources and mineral rights can be subdivided and, and sold. A, a person might have 100% of the mineral rights on that property, or uh, they might sell off some of those mineral rights. A lot of people um, sold off their mineral rights during the Great Depression so that they could have money to live on, basically. Or they might sell off just a percentage of them, 50%. Or, you know, it, it could be that, that that percentage gets handed down depending upon inheritance laws in that state after the person dies. And, you know, you can, you can end up going from, you know, 100%, 50%, 25%, all the way down to these really small percentages. And you think, okay, well, why am I gonna be worried about a percentage of a mineral right for 0 0.001 
percent. Well, if you happen to have 0.001 percent of mineral mineral rights for uh, a very lucrative property, that can work out to be millions and even billions of dollars. So once you start talking about big numbers, that's important. And of course, at that point, um, the legal system is usually um, brought in into play. And a lot of times, people need to know. Well, who owns this property? Well, we have to know who the who the ancestors of this person or the descendants of this person are in order to determine that. So that's where property conveyances, not just land and houses, but mineral rights like that. And particularly like here in Colorado, water is like gold. Um, in, in Colorado, the, the thing that has been probably the biggest natural resource has been gold. And I'm not gold, water. We think of we think of it being gold or at one time silver or something to that effect. It's really water because we live in a high desert here. And really? hmm. gunfights at, at the OK Corral about, you know, who owns the water upstream. So. Wow. Who to thunk it? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, you get into things like royalty interest, which is the right to the income from, say, a well or something like that. So, so you've got a, a million dollars of income from oil produced in, in a well in one year. 10% of that amount of royalty is interest, royalty interest is owned by a person in that well. That comes out to $100,000 a year. So um, small numbers can become, make a big difference, you know, in the, in the long run. Wow. Um, the landman cometh. This is this is the funny part. Is because you know oftentimes we're dealing with landmen. They've they've got a, a company or a corporation who said, you know, we think we we need to develop our our interest in this area and this particular mineral resource. And oh look, it falls on this old farm that's here. Um, landman, go out there and see what we have to do to acquire that. And he's got to understand real estate transactions and he's got to figure out who owns the property now and are there any descendants who might have a claim to that property? And a lot of times they get genealogists in, involved at that point. Now this is, this is an interesting situation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There's a, or an example, someone had contacted me about a woman who owned a, a farm in Florida and she died in intestate, meaning she had no will. So she's got this farm and for whatever reason, um, she dies in 1927 for whatever reason this property had not been probated and that's a long time you know it's this is i was contacted about this um let's see last year in 2018 and the they had to get hold of a gene, professional genealogist and find out who are her heirs who does who does this property go to and we knew that there was an uncle who had moved to philadelphia in 1928 and we knew the, the name of the uncle um we had found the address of the uncle and we found that generations of families had lived. He had moved to Pittsburgh and uh, no, I'm sorry, Philadelphia. And he'd lived in this same rental house. Generations of people had lived in this same rental house uh, in this area. Well, there, it, it was a very impoverished area and, you know, a property inheritance to somebody who lived in that area would be a life changing thing to happen. But they had long since lost contact with these these people, and I got contacted by another forensic genealogist who said, um, "You know, I keep calling these people, and I keep telling them you need to contact me. You may have inherited some property in, in Florida, and they're just kind of blowing them off, I think, because they think it's a it's a robocall or something. You know, <laughs> you couldn't get a hold of them. Um, Can you imagine getting that phone call? Yeah, yeah. Well, and." and I can certainly understand the person on the receiving end of this phone call, um, not even letting the person, you know, complete, just bam. <laughs> but that, that could be, you know, that's, that's an example of um, where forensic genealogy comes into play in, in property and in probate situations. I don't understand something on this, though. If the, if the, the land was not vacant, people were living on this land? General, I don't, I don't know, know that people were living on this land. Um, and honestly, I was doing a very, very small piece of a much larger project, so I didn't get a lot of the details. Either the, the people who were living on the land never felt it was necessary to get the property changed over to them. You know, they stayed, stayed there and continued to farm. Or 
maybe everybody dissipated. Nobody lived on the property for years and years and years. I mean, I don't know the specifics of this case because I was doing one tiny little piece of it. Um, and maybe people were freeloading on this land for decades. That, that could very well be. I mean, it could be that somebody, uh, well, I was going to say it could be that somebody was trying to say this is our property, get off the property, or maybe they, um, maybe they were approached by tax assessors and said, you haven't paid your taxes on this property in a really long time. Or maybe the people have been paying the taxes on it in somebody else's name. I mean, there could have been a whole lot of different scenarios, but. Well, that's just fun to think about all the different possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your, your genealogy mind. What is it? That, that thing you were saying about curiosity. It just. Yes. And, curiosity gets you. And it starts yeah. the research questions, right? <laughs> Right. That's what generates those research questions. Now, this is an interesting one, too. Uh, here's another place where um, actually DNA does come into play. And uh, th this, a lot of times people think that DNA is going to be the silver bullet that answers all of the, all, everyone's genealogy questions. And, and most of us who've been doing genealogy for a while realize that, that that's not really true. But here's a, here's a good example of... Um, where DNA came in into play. There was a woman who had applied for welfare support for her and her children. She had, I think, four children or six children. And the state required her to take a DNA test to prove that the child was hers. The DNA te test came back, the results came back showing that the child was not the woman's. In fact, it didn't match up. So you would think, okay, that's the end of story, right? She's not telling the truth. It's not her kid. She's not going to get uh, any DNA evidence. Well, it just so happened that the woman was pregnant at the time this was happening. Um, so when she delivered the child, I don't remember if it was her or the state that had a DNA test taken of the new newborn right there in the delivery room. And that newborn baby's DNA came back and said the woman was not her mother. So what happened there? They, they've been in the delivery room. The woman swears up and down the other child is her child. They're in the delivery room. She delivers the baby. They test the DNA and come back and say, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> but that does There not are exceptions to the yeah, DNA rule. So, so this, is, this is an interesting phenomenon that um, it's called a chimera. A chimera, a chimera. That's what happens here. The, a chimera is actually a person who has more than one set of DNA in their body. And there's three known reasons for this happening right now. Now, interestingly enough, it could be either that, well, I'll just touch on these, either the, the fetus absorbs a twin, so there'll be twin uh, cells there during, during the conception, and one of the, one of the fetuses actually ends up absorbing the other one, um, and the DNA is maintained, so there's one person who has two separate sets of DNA in their body, or a pregnant mother might absorb the DNA of a child, um, there have been instances in the past where a woman was pregnant and the pregnancy kind of went away. And a lot of times they call that a ghost pregnancy. Like maybe she was never pregnant or she was actually, she actually was pregnant, but she absorbed that DNA into her body and the pregnancy just sort of dissipated. Um, and then a third way that's known is bone marrow transplants. And they're taking bone marrow from someone else and putting it into a person. And now you have bone marrow with a different DNA in your system. Oh, one thing I'd thrown out there as a, a possible cause, and I've not researched this, but I've wondered, is stem, well, you know, with stem cell therapy has been a big, a big, there's been a big push in that in the industry for knee repairs and joint repairs and stuff. Might that also be a, a cause of uh, a possible existence of another DNA in a person's body? So I, I have heard Blaine Bettinger talk on this subject uh, about, for those who are not familiar with Blaine Bettinger, Google him, he's awesome, about the bone marrow transplant. I, I believe it was organ donation. I want to think there was some other, like the stem cell therapy that you're talking about, that there was, yeah. yes, there we go. <laughs> you're right on the money, Connie, yeah. Chimeras are, are considered a very rare occurrence, um, but what the, the research I've done has shown that it's not necessarily a rare occurrence, it's just that it's never been it's never been studied as a subject on its own. It's always something that comes as a byproduct of another study. And somebody goes, oh, wow, what happened here? Ah, this is a chimera. Oh, that doesn't happen really often. Well, there's some people out there that think that that does happen. And it ha happens a lot more often than people think it does. So that's just something to keep in mind. I mean, 
we're on we're sort of on the very um, tip of the iceberg in terms of what DNA can tell us and where it can take us in the future. I think I think in the next um, you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, we're going to see a huge difference in how we view DNA. Uh, we're excited about it now for genealogy reasons, but I think there's a whole world out there yet to be discovered. I'm wondering if we should be asking when we are trying to resolve DNA cases, uh, I was working on one recently where I was helping a gentleman find his father. If we should be asking everybody involved, uh, have you had a organ transplant? <laughs> have you had, you know, I, I don't even know, I'm on blood transfusion. Right. Um, you know? Yes. And, you know, when with the test that most people are taking out there right now for DNA are a cheek swab or a spitting into a tube. Um, this woman who gave birth to two children that didn't match her DNA, she had a uterus that had a different DNA. Um, I actually went to a writing camp a few years back and met a woman who was using writing as a therapy because in her adult years, she had gone in and had uh, had, a, had what they thought at first was a tumor removed from her stomach area, I think it was. And they thought it was a benign tumor. It's just a growth there that needs to be removed because it was causing her some issues. And after they removed it, found that it was actually the remains of her twin. And she was, she was going through this workshop to uh, write about this in a story to try it because had, it had jolted her. And I'm sure that would jolt anybody <laughs> to learn something like that. That is fascinating. Yeah, so there's uh, there's still a lot to be learned out there about it. Um, I guess as a forensic genealogist, you kind of have to be a you have to you have to be wearing a lot of hats too. I mean, you do, and you, you gotta know, pull in a genetic genealogist in order to really right. And I think part of being a good forensic genealogist also is being aware of all these things that could happen out there. I mean, um, you've seen. You've seen how that uh, how that could affect people searching for family families that are alive now, or relatives or cousins or um, a an unknown parent situation. Um, but just just like you were just saying, that opens, particularly in the legal field, that opens a big can of worms. And um, you know, yeah. as a forensic genealogist, you have to really keep that keep in mind that. No, none of us is going to be an expert in all of these different areas, but just being aware of this kind of thing, you can say, well, I know of this case, and then that'll point you in the direction of the right specialist or the right uh, professional to get to. Interesting. So, yeah, so this is, this is again, all falls under the umbrella of forensic genealogy. Now, criminal investigations is another area where uh, forensic genealogy has had a large impact lately. There's a, an article out there in the Boston Globe from 2017 uh, called Finding Lisa. Um, it's about a, a little girl who was abducted and years later uh, is helped through a forensic de genealogist to find her family. Where I think in the me what's been in the me media in the last couple of years that's been very sensational is this older Golden State Killer case where they actually found found out who was the murderer in this this series of mass murders or not mass murders but a series of murders and they did it with DNA but not just DNA they had to have someone who was experienced in genealogy so this was a forensic genealogist. And they, they would not have found this person had they not had the genealogy skills. They already had the DNA. They had the DNA for some time, but they didn't, they haven't used genealogy skills to actually go in and gather more information. And when they did, they found the killer. And I think that has really opened up the minds of um, police ag agencies and investigators and stuff. That's, that's had a big impact on how forensic genealogy can assist. Um, there's a there's a lot to be there's a, a lot of room out there for it. Um, it also kind of changes our culture in a little in a, a little bit. Um, you know the effect on criminal investigations using forensic genealogy is it's a deterrent to criminals. Your DNA is everywhere. You know if you've been there and you've 
I don't know, spit or bled or <laughs> done anything, brushed up against something and lost a little skin off something, there's DNA there. Um, this might this might influence someone who's considering a murder and it, you know stop a murder before it actually happens. Um, it can also help our society in that rather than having to, to wait over years and collect evidence over 5, 10, 15, 20 years and then figure out who the serial killer is, you know, they can, they can find out who this is before any more tragedies occur. Um, the, I've been told that over 50% of the criminals apprehended through DNA evidence were not on the original list of persons of interest. Uh, that's a large percentage. Um, so I find this area really interesting. Um, yeah. it, just fascinating to me. It, it is fascinating. And you think about it, that's going to save the local, state, and federal agencies a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources. Um, so I think, again, you know, you are looking at lab tests and whatnot, but this is not just forensics. This is forensic genealogy. They can't find this information without the help of a genealogist who understands uh, what's going on and, and what other records can be pulled in to, to help them. Well, in the case of the Golden State Killer, I know it certainly helped point them in the right direction. This guy was really not, I think, on their radar screen originally. And when they uh, made the connection using the GEDmatch third-party software and finding other family members and, and you know, drilling it down into uh, some of the local, the, the closer family members, they started to realize who it could be. And then they go collect the DNA evidence out of his trash can uh, mm -hmm. in order to confirm uh, their suspicions, which to me was just earth shattering. It was groundbreaking as far as criminal investigations go. I, I agree. And, um, you know, there's, there have been people who have really protested this approach and said, oh, but you'll be, you'll have all of these people on the, on the list just because they have DNA that might, might not have anything to do with it. You know, I think the idea is they were afraid that these people might be identified as persons of interest when they're not. Well, that's happening now. Um, this is, this is a way to narrow down that, that list of persons of interest and narrow it into, um, more, a more focused area and that is more likely to be correct, more likely to produce the result that's needed rather than, you know, this, this very large list of people that, you know, it's, it, I don't think that, I don't think that argument holds in my opinion anyways, because. I agree. And it also depends on where the DNA comes from. If it comes from the handle of the knife that was used to stab the guy, it's pretty obvious that, you know, more than likely, <laughs> you know, that I, th I agree. Um, but, you know, they still have to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, just like they do anything else. Yeah. And then uh, another area that I had mentioned earlier where this ge forensic genealogy comes into play is unclaimed remains. Um, bodies of people who have, don't, we don't know who their, what their identity is. Uh, there are people that show up. Um, in the local, state, and federal coroner's office, medical examiner's office, um, and it's, it's usually at the county level, and they've got no one to claim that body. What do they do with that body? There's not enough, there's no identification on the body. No one has come forth to claim the body. Um, there's actually, and, and there's, you know, these guys are always going through budget cuts and, and working on limited budgets. Um, this might be an area that, that they can be helped there's a, actually a site called NAMUS, which stands for the National Institute, Institute of Justice, Justice's National Missing and Unified, Unidentified Persons System. And it's actually a repository of information on missing persons uh, who have not been identified. Um, so, you know, you can, you, they actually, you actually go out there to this site and they have a list of these people who have never been identified. They're posting it because they're trying to find help. They're trying to find information uh, to figure out what to do with these remains. There's also another site called ForgottenAshes.com, which is a website dedicated to helping family members find cremation remains of, of other family members. So 
unclaimed remains is another potential application for forensic genealogy. Wow, interesting. This is, this is an example of the website for unidentified remains in Denver County. You can actually go on to the department, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and you can get to this website, and it will give you a list of the cases. Um, these are the different cases of unidentified remains that, that are being held that they need help with uh, identifying them. Um, I blew one up, just one of, one of them in the list up, just so you can see the kind of information. Uh, so this has a case number. Uh, the year that the body was found, notice it's 2002, where it was found, uh, when it was found, whether it's a male or female, sometimes the race is known, sometimes it's not, the age, you know, they've gathered all of this information, the, the height of the person and the weight of them, the hair color, um, the person has no front teeth and no tattoos or scars. Uh, so they've got somebody there and they say, we can get all of this information, but we don't know who this person is. And they publish it out there so that people can say, you know, people go out saying, oh, yes, I think I do know who this is. I've seen this person before or whatever. Now, I will, I will warn you. I want to put the caveat in there that um, I didn't include the picture here of the body. It can be very uh, disturbing to see these pictures. So be forewarned, folks, if you're going to go out there, I'm not going to put one of those pictures in my slide. But, um you know, this is real life. These are people who have passed on, and it's not pretty. I wonder if they're doing DNA uh, research on these folks. I, I'm sure they probably are. I think it's a case of if you don't have a match for them, you know, what do you do? So. Wow. And they, they, they oftentimes don't have the budget to pay somebody to sit down uh, or, or the expertise to sit down and say, you know, take that DNA and extract it and put it into GEDmatch and do the things that you and I might know, know to do or other forensic genealogists might know to do to help them with this. Interesting. So here's where we get to the caution slide, uh, talking about the difference between a genealogist and a forensic genealogist. There, there are very distinct differences between somebody who's doing this for uh, family history. I mean, family history is fun. You know, we're finding out that great uncle so-and-so had a spill down the road. You know, or we're finding out that the great, great, great uncle so-and-so uh, had, had made a claim for a meal and 175 pounds of bacon, right? And <laughs> these are fun stories. Um, it's a little different when you get into forensic genealogy. First of all, the reporting is different. They want only the facts. It's usually going to court. You're usually dealing with law lawyers and legal people, and they want the most trimmed back information you could possibly give them. They don't want all of the, the story or the context behind it. In some cases, for instance, if you're doing forensic genealogy for the military, you're required to have to be a certified genealogist. Now, at least a certified genealogist has to sign off on your work. You might not be the certified genealogist, but you have to be, uh, the, the military is actually contracting the CG and won't contract you if you don't have, if you're not certified. Uh, this is an area where you definitely need liability insurance because we're talking about legal issues. So as a genealogist, you need to make sure that you understand what those liability, what kind of liability insurance you need. You need to have a really good understanding of professional boundaries. What's the difference between practicing law, a private investigator, and a genealogist? In forensic genealogy, these, these boundaries become blurred very quickly. For instance, in some, in many states, in, well, in all states, I believe, you have to be required to, in order to practice law, you have to have a license to do that. As a private investigator in many states, not all, but in, in most states, you're required to have a license. Um, as a genealogist, you don't have to have a license to practice genealogy. Uh, but you need to make sure that you get some training under your belt so that you know when you're crossing over that boundary. For instance, if a lawyer should come to me and, as a forensic genealogist and say, we have, this is an airship case, I need to know who of these people is in line to um, inherit from this property. As a forensic genealogist, I have to have the great training and background to say, wait, I can't tell you who can inherit. That's a legal issue. I can tell you who the descendants are. That's a genealogy issue. I can do that. Unless I happen to be actual private invest or uh, an actual lawyer who's licensed in that state. Um, but I think it's very important for people to understand that it's 
very easy to cross over those boundaries if you're not careful. You could inadvertently, in trying to be helpful, you could inadvertently interfere with the actual execution of the law or cost people a lot of money or get into some serious legal trouble yourself. So um, I would caution people to make sure that they sit down and really study and get the, get education, educate themselves in what forensic genealogy is as opposed to any of the other fields. Yep, I totally agree. So you might say, okay, so how do I do that? How do I find out? Um, how do I get, are there credentials? Uh, there is one credentialing society called the Council for the Advancement of Forensic Genealogy, CAFG. That's their website there. Um, they set the standards for practice and conduct for forensic genealogists. They oversee the credentialing, uh, and they have a source of professional genealogists. So um, they actually have a directory where you can go online and you can find someone who is a professional genealogist. It's kind of like a, a professional forensic genealogist specifically. So um, yeah, that, that's a really good, that's a good agency for doing that. Um, in terms of training, uh, how do I build up to getting this certification? How do I get, build up my skill set? Um, there are institutes, there are skill building um, modules, there are mentors, there's a mentorship program out there. Um, the, the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh, I attended that forensic genealogy class last summer. That's an excellent class. They have that again. They're offering it again this year in 2019. Uh, there's the NIGS Forensics Genealogy Class 101, that's online. Uh, the BCG, which is the Board of Certified Genealogists, offers skill building in this area. Skill building, they have a skill builder called Standards and, and Forensic Genealogy. And you can also sign up to get a mentor through the Council of Adva Advancement of Forensic Genealogy. So do you have sort of somebody sort of mentor you and, and say, okay, um, you know, you might actually work under them to do a specific kind of work, or you might have a question, or you might say, how do I foray into this without uh, crossing boundaries that I shouldn't and, you know, not over-representing my skill set, and what should I do? And that mentor, you'll be paired up with a mentor who will tell you those kinds of things. You know, you brought it all home because people that are interested in, in maybe going into this as a career, uh, or maybe are professional genealogists now, but haven't really stepped into the forensic genealogy uh, venue. Um, thank you for the information here because, you know, this kind of helps guide them in the right direction. It yeah. definitely is a fascinating, uh, and I imagine um, lucrative. <laughs> I, you know, I would think yeah. that this is in demand, you know, yeah. especially with uh, exactly. cold cases and stuff. I, yeah, and I think you've hit on something there. Um, the pockets are run deeper in this in terms of the opportunity to make money. Um, you know, it, it, the bottom line is that, that the legal system has more money to spend on trying to get to the bottom of these issues. These issues are drawing more attention and more money because um, they're rooted in property or, or criminal criminal justice or something to that effect. And so there are deeper pockets. There is, I think, more of an opportunity to make, make money as a genealogist if you've got the right skill set and once you've established a, re a reputation for your, yourself. Um, I think one of the things, this is, this is the last slide I really have on this, on forensic genealogy. I think forensic gene gene genealogy in, in general has become a formidable tool in our legal system, and I think it's just going to grow. I think uh, the limitations are just, I mean, I can see this mushrooming. I think it affects us greatly as a society at a local, state, and federal level. It affects us at a personal level, um, and it's still in its infancy. I mean, we... Not a lot of people, a lot of times when I, when I mention the term forensic genealogy to somebody, they have no concept of what I'm talking about. It's a fairly new field in, in, the, way, in the way that it's defined right now. Um, and I wonder, you know, what does it hold for our future? What kind of, where are we going to see this go in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Uh, 
I, I kind of say, you know, I want to say fasten your seatbelts because I have a feeling this is going to be a pretty interesting ride uh, to keep up with what's going on in the forensic genealogy world. In the no doubt. No doubt. I think, you know, that is co totally fascinating. You know, if somebody wanted to go into forensic genealogy and maybe not, maybe they don't want to get into the criminal aspect of it, but just the, you know, helping with land. Mm -hmm. and helping with finding heirs to, you know, estates that, you know, people that it, you know, maybe something's been handed down in a will and they can't find the people or whatever. I mean, there's a variety of areas that um, people could go into, even if they didn't want to get involved in the criminal stuff. But, you know, yes. stuff I think is fascinating, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think the cold case stuff is really fascinating. That's what I get get interested in is uh, is the cold case stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, even forensic genealogy is a special a specialization in the field of genealogy. But even within forensic genealogy, there's a, a lot of specializations. There are people there that deal with primarily mineral rights and natural resource rights. There are people who do this that are, um, their area of expertise is really in uh, repatriating military remains. And even, even within that specialization, there are a lot of, subspecializing categories um there you know, i hadn't even thought about the missing persons part of it when you mentioned that um you know trying to identify unidentified, unidentified people um you know it really had I, I was always imagining uh cold cases that are you know from crimes but uh just people that have died on the street <laughs> you know maybe it's a homeless person or something yeah or, you yeah. know, a variety of situations, but um, interesting stuff. I really yeah. appreciate you uh, taking the time. Yeah, well, it was my pleasure. It's, it's a fascinating subject, and I mean, it's one of those that uh, you throw that all on the table, whether you're sitting with a bunch of genealogists or even non-genealogists, there's a, you're gonna have a lively conversation there. And, and I think there's a need there. You know, I really do, I think that there's a big need there. Um, I know that those forensic genealogy classes and DNA classes and it grip fill up really quickly. Uh, and they usually end up having to open another class. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for genealogists in this field. I imagine, you know, I'm in a relatively small town and I know there are no forensic genealogists in this town. It'd probably really be, be real easy for somebody to go to the local DA or go to the local, you know, a couple lawyers and say, Hey, I'm doing this now, you know, hang your shingle on the, on the wall. And, uh, and, you know, once you get properly educated and everything in it and probably go into business pretty quickly, especially, yeah. you know, the, everybody, you know, even the lawyers and those guys understand, you know, the skills that you can bring, they're probably like, Oh yeah, we could use that. Yeah, I think so. And, um, because in some cases, they're probably using their secretary in the office to help dig out some of this information or an assistant or something until they can find a proper resource to. Um, right, so. right. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time today and, and educate us on forensic genealogy. Um, fascinating subject. It really is a fascinating job. subject. I, uh, I hope to see this industry grow and, and have us see more, more expertise coming out. I think, I think we're right on the cusp of it well and thanks for uh coming back again too uh, you're starting to become a regular over here and 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 we love having you well thank you for having me i'm always so thrilled when you invite me i, I love sitting down and talking to you about the genealogy and, and anytime I, keep I, coming I, back we love it <laughs> great i'll be here <laughs> all right Take care. Hey, huge thanks to Christine Cochran for coming to us again, and this time explaining forensic genealogy. As a reminder, everything we talked about in this show, there are links in the show notes below on the YouTube channel. Also, I'm going to put right over here a link to all of the footnotes episodes, as well as a link to the Learn Genealogy TV series for you, if, especially if you're new to genealogy. This is a great place to start. Okay, until next time. Keep on climbing your family tree.